Let us enter the worship of our Lord today. Would you rise to your feet? Our call to worship comes from Psalm 19. Look at the heavens. They are shouting the glory of God. The days and the nights declare the magnificence of God's creative works. Let our words of praise be acceptable to you. Our Lord, our rock, our redeemer. Please join me in prayer. O oh, gracious and loving God, we have come together today to come before you in worship, to bring to you the confessions of our hearts, our souls, and our lives, to seek the redemptive touch of your Holy Spirit which is the hope of our salvation, and Lord, the strength of our future. So bless this time and this hour as we gather your children to worship you now. Here by faith in him to dwell, for I know whatever before me, Jesus doeth all things well, for I know whatever before me, Jesus doeth all things well. All the way my Savior leads me, each winding path I tread gives me grace for every trial, feeds me with all living bread. Though my weary steps may falter and my soul of thirst may be gushing from the rock before me. Though a spring of joy I see Gushing from the rock before me Though a spring of joy I see All the way my Savior leads me Oh, the fullness of His love Perfect trust to me is promised in my Father's house above. When my spirit clothed immortal wings its flight to realms of day, this my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. This my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the Our scripture reading today comes from the book of James, chapter 3, 1 through 12, and it's page 855 in the Pew Bible. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. 
Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird and reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus, no spring yields both salt water and fresh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Last week, we had a moment of emphasis and a time to look at, through video, some of the work that is being done by the Virginia WMU in cooperation with Virginia Baptist as well. Today we have an in-gathering of our Alma Hunt offerings that go to many of those missions and ministries that both we talked about and the insert last week shared with you. So I pray that as Robbie comes to play right now, that if you are prepared to give to the Alma Hunt offering, that you will come forward at this time and do so, just as Robbie plays, depositing it in the basket on our altar. Join me now, if you will, in a blessing upon these offerings. Lord God, these are offerings for missions and ministry that could not take place were it not for our connectedness of prayers and giving. Lord, bless now these gifts that you may take them and utilize to grow and to bring about your kingdom. O oh Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit working through people today and working in people's lives for tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen. It is sweet to know as I onward go the way of the cross leads home. I invite you to stand as you are able and to join as we sing. Number 151, the way of the cross leads home. needs go home by the way of the cross there's no other way but this i shall never get sight 
of the gates of light, if the way of the cross I miss. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go, the way of the cross leads home. I must needs go on in the blood-sprinkled way, the path that the Savior trod. If I ever climb to the gate sublime, where the soul is at home with God. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go. The way of the cross leads home. Then I bid farewell to the way of the world, to walk in it nevermore. For the Lord says, Come, and I seek my home, where the waits by the open door. The way of the cross leads home, the way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go, the way of the cross leads home. Bring ye the tithes into the storehouse, and he will bless them. We need to remember that as we're thinking about our offerings to our church. This has been a difficult time for each and every one, and our church is suffering as well as everyone else. So let's bring our tithes to the storehouse and remember that God will bless them and use them to his ongoing kingdom. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you with grateful hearts for all the things that you have blessed us with. You are a kind and wonderful Father, and we thank you most graciously for being our Father. Bless the offerings that have been brought to this, your church, and may we use them for the glorification of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. This is time of our children's moment. If any of our young people want to join me for our children's moment, come on down. Not as enthusiastic this morning. Okay. Hey guys, how are you all this morning? Doing good? Yeah, you should be. You just got back from the beach. Isn't that great? Was the beach fun? I think it is too. Yeah, I love it when I get to go to the beach. Did you have? What was your favorite part? Playing in the sand. What about you, Sophie? The fires on the beach. Okay, that's cool. Um, we're going to talk today, since you all just went to the beach, you kind of went on a trip, didn't you? On a journey. Who knew, who was driving? Both of them at the same time? So who was behind the wheel? Your dad? Okay, and your mom was telling him how to drive, or what was, did she take her turns now and then? Okay, all right. Well, we take a trip with somebody, and we just decide that, you know, that they're going to lead us where we need to go, and sometimes we don't know where we're going. Have you ever seen this on a phone? What is that? It's like a travel app, isn't it? It's, it's a map, and you can plug in here, you know, like where you want to go and, and, uh, and everything, and it will tell you exactly how to get there. i tell you what, let's, uh, let's see how I can get home today, okay? Let's... Plug in 74, Dora Trail. Oh, there it is. Oh, look, here I am. Let's see, directions. It should take 14 minutes. <laughs> He's never rode with me. Um, but, uh, well, particularly the way I go is more 15. I go out more than that. Okay, let's go. Route to 74 Dora Trail. Oh, wow, it's starting the route and everything. Chatham Heights Road, then turn right. It tells you exactly how to get, it even talks to you on where to go. And then I bet if we go the wrong direction, it says recalculate, turn around at the next turnaround spot and, and do that. Yeah, we do those kinds of things a lot, don't we? Well, you know, Jesus talks about being on a journey. Um, in fact, in a minute, we're going to talk about that, that his disciples were on a journey following him. Well, in a sense, even we, his disciples, all these many years later, are still on a journey with him. So we want to remember that, and we want to remember we're on a trip. We're on a trip, not just, that's okay, just not, not just like the beach, but a trip to where Jesus wants us to be, okay? Let's bow together in prayer. Lord, thank you so much that we're not only on a trip or a journey, you know, for you, we're with you. You're right there beside us leading us, directing us, and taking us the way we need to go. Help us to do that now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys very much. Y'all want to go with Jamie to Children's Church? Where are we going? Yeah, that's a good question. I'll take this off for the reading. Our text comes from Mark chapter 8, in verse 27, through the end of the chapter in verse 38. We are talking this morning about trips and about journeys. We are talking about the fact that we have to journey or walk with Jesus to know who he is and to follow where he wants us to go. Beginning with verse 27, Jesus went out along with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. 
And on the way, he questioned his disciples, saying to them, Who do people say that I am? Well, they told him, saying, John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. But others, well, one of the prophets anyway. Well, Jesus continued then by questioning them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. And he warned them to tell no one about him. Well, Jesus then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Now, he was stating the matter plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around... And seeing his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Jesus then summoned the crowd with his disciples, and he said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man that he gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his very soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Come follow me, I heard him say, come follow me, I'll show you the way, leave all behind, I'll grant you treasure on high, come follow me. Come to the cross where sinners are saved. Come to the cross where all debts are paid. Here at the cross, the Son of God gave his life. Here at the cross, come to the cross, come and behold, see where he laid, come and behold, an empty grave, he is alive, there's victory. And behold, he is alive with the Spirit's power dwelling now within. We will take our cross, we will follow him and tell the world of his cleansing blood and that through the cross we have overcome with the Spirit's power dwell 
dwelling now within. We will take our cross, we will follow him and tell the world of his cleansing blood, and that through the cross we have overcome. Come to the cross, come and be saved. Come to the cross, your sins washed away. Fall on your knees before the Lord God Most High. There at the cross, Christ gave his life. Take up the cross, give him your life. This text that we have read from takes place on the way. A major theme throughout Mark's gospel, because Mark is an on-the-go, getting-with-it gospel, everything in a hurry, and constantly Mark is always referring to, and they were on their way, or they immediately went up to. Mark's Jesus is clearly a man on the move. From the very beginning of the gospel, Jesus travels from Nazareth to the banks of the Jordan. He travels to the region of Galilee and then to Capernaum, to the country of the Gerasenes and Gennesaret, to Tyre, to the district of Dalmanutha. He goes to Bethsaida, and now he is entering close to the region in the city of Caesarea Philippi. He's been up and down mountains, across waters, back again, all the while preaching and teaching and healing and telling stories. But the conversation that they have on their way to Caesarea Philippi is kind of like, well, it's like no other really at this point. Because what is at issue now is not so much what Jesus does, but who is Jesus? Who is he? There is something deeper taking place in that simple word at the beginning of the way. They were on their way. According to other places in the New Testament, especially Acts chapter 9 and chapter 19, the early church the very, very early church, identifies itself or is identified by others as the people of the way. It's a metaphor as much as an actual physical journey. They are followers of the way. The way of what? The way of Jesus. In Acts 9, we're told of Saul's conversion and the appearance of Christ on the road to stop him from his persecution. As he was going to Damascus of all places, we're told he was going to um, persecute the followers of the way. So it's in the early DNA of the church, which is before even Mark's gospel, but by the time Mark writes his gospel around 70 AD, it's obviously a moniker that has caught on about the church, and here in the gospel, Jesus begins with asking, what do other people say about me? Who do people say that I am? Well, to his initial question, the disciples give three answers. They begin by saying, well, a, a few people are starting to say that you're just like John the Baptist. You know, in fact, you might even be John the Baptist come back from the dead. You know, so you are, you're, you're John, who's now deceased at this time. 
Another says, well, some people are saying you're Elijah. Now, if you're going to be complimented, that's a really good compliment. I mean, you're, you're being told that, that you're Elijah. Come back to us. Well, Elijah is the prophet of prophets. He is the measuring stick by which all prophets in, uh, in Israel are ever measured. So that's not a bad thing. And then others said, well, you know, they say you're just one of the other prophets. You know, you're a prophet that showed up and, and you know, glad to have you. You're just one of the prophets. Well, despite the answers given, it, Jesus has asked them, what do people, who do people say that I am? He has received answers uh, from people who are not on the way. They are not on the journey, as the disciples are. So now he turns to the disciples who are on the way with him, and they say to him, who do you say that I am? Now, the other answers were acceptable, but all of a sudden he says to them, who do you say that I am? Earlier in the fourth chapter, Jesus tells them they have been given the secret of the kingdom of God, and I guess Jesus is wondering, will their answer reveal what they remember or what they've seen? Now, we know that the response is from Peter. And one of the problems when you read the narrative of the Gospels, or any written piece sometimes, but when you read it, you, you tend to, okay, there's a period, but there's a sentence right after it. So you plow right into the next sentence, because who do you say that I am? And then the next sentence is, well, Peter, to Peter who's one of the 12, says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Okay, do you really think it was that fast? If you ever sat in a classroom, Come on now, think about it. When you sat in a class and the teacher asked you, asked the group, the question, what did you do? Oh, oh, pick me. Oh, come on now. If the hard ones in particular, what did you do? Well, you know, I haven't really looked at this page in this book for a while, so I think I'll just look at it. Maybe somebody will answer. Or you look around and say, I never counted the ceiling tile before. One, two, three. Or you look out the window and you say, hmm, wonder what the weather is like today. Or the truth of the matter is, for people who say that prayer is not in school, you pray, oh God, don't let her pick me. Well, I think there was some silence there. I think they turned around a little bit here and there. You know, the fish was pretty good tonight. Yeah, yeah, I don't know what he did on it, but, you know, that's, that, was a, that was pretty good. Yeah, 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 we got any more to drink over there? Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, oh, is he talking to us? Oh, you know, the fire's getting down. We need to poke it a little bit. But the one who seems to always be willing to jump out in front, for better or for worse, is Peter. And Peter immediately, or as soon as he can get the gumption up, speaks... I don't know whether he's speaking for himself or the group. It's kind of unclear. But Peter says, you're not one of the prophets. You're the Messiah. You're the Christ. You are the Christ. And you can almost hear the other disciples. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, that's it. Well, Peter says, you are the Christ. Christ stood as a title for honor and glorious majesty. Ralph Martin, the great New Testament scholar, talks about the fact that it kind of appears later in wisdom literature that is written later in the history of Israel, but not too far prior to the time of Jesus. And, and it often talks about this anticipation of Israel's ultimate triumph over her foes and leading them as this warrior prince who will liberate and lift them all into preeminence for the world to see. And he's often, he is referred to in those passages with a prince's name known as God's Messiah or chosen one. And my guess is that's Peter's understanding as he says, you're the Christ. I mean, it makes sense and it's the greatest story ever to think about. But then Jesus responds, and when he responds, it becomes a little evident that 
maybe Jesus is looking at a different text in the Bible. Jesus says, you know, hey, you're right. But he turns around and he says, look, he begins to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and that he must be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and then be killed. Jesus isn't thinking about some glamorous word of a, a warrior prince and of power here on earth. He is thinking more in the line of Isaiah 53. You remember the suffering servant passage. Jesus tells them, there's going to be a lot of suffering on the way with me. A lot. Peter identifies Jesus as Messiah, but immediately turns, Jesus turns around and challenges what he meant by saying he was the Messiah. That isn't what Peter expects to hear. It's not what even he wants to hear. So he does what you and I do when we hear what we don't want to hear. Uh-uh. Nuh-uh, Jesus. That ain't it. You, you missed that one. That's not the way it's going to be. In fact, he says he rebukes Jesus, and you can, after 21 years, you hear it once, you hear it a million times. You know, the, the Greek word for rebuke in Mark is epitomao, and if you were to take that literal kind of translation out to an image, it was often used to refer to the instructor, the teacher, the rabbi, wrapping the knuckles of the pupil with a ruler. I'm looking at Glenn's laughing because I think maybe when he started to teach, he could still wrap knuckles. I don't know if he could or even ever did. But, um, you know, that's, that's the image. Peter wraps Jesus on the knuckles. It's not going to happen that way. But then Jesus turns around and Jesus is deciding, I tell you who needs a little rapping on the knuckles, and he grabs Peter's hand, wham, and he rebukes Peter. In fact, he not only rebukes Peter, he goes on and he declares that not only are you not following the way, Peter, you have become a stumbling block of Satan, who needs to get out of sight. That's what he means when he says, get behind me get out of sight. You are setting your mind on man's ideal, our own ideals, rather than being open in God's way. Well, what is our ideal? Well, if you look at what Peter is kind of rebuking Jesus about, I think we can figure out where we identify with Peter on this. What is our ideal? Well, to be spared suffering. We don't think if we're following God's Son, we ought to be suffering. Our ideal is to be in control of our journey and our world around our journey. To be able to say that I'm not going to submit to letting other people decide for us, chiefs and elders. That's not going to happen. I'm not going to have to go through that. And what's more, I'm going to be in control of this journey. Jesus has something else in mind. He calls the crowd to him, he says, and Jesus begins teaching them what it means to set one's mind on divine things rather than human things. And it's kind of the final contrast in the passage. As he says, it is like the difference between uh, trying to save your life, you're going to lose it, and trying to lose your life or willing to lose your life for the gospel's sake and for mine, you will find your life. Now, of course, this is Jesus' prediction coming of his death. And it is the beginning in Mark's gospel of three consecutive predictions here in the eighth chapter, again in the ninth, and once more in the tenth. But what Jesus is saying is, you haven't, you've spoken well, Peter, but you don't understand what it means. And what's more is, you haven't really denied yourself and followed me. You haven't put me above you in this journey. And Jesus proclaims 
There's nothing you can give in exchange for your life. If you hold on to it, you're going to lose it. If you keep it like it's some sort of property, you're going to lose it, just like you could lose property. Jesus says, well, you know, if you want to gain something, lose it. Lose it with us. We aren't called to hold on to this life. That's one of our problems as a human being. The older I get, the more I want to hold on. The older we all get, the more we want to hold on. We don't like to let go, and it may go who knows where. But to be followers walking along with Jesus, we have to recognize our faith commitments did not end at the beginning. You know, we dunk people in this water back here, and we contemporary disciples might take heart with the original 12, but we, we talk about a lifetime journey. But the truth is that there are those who too often think, or worse yet teach, that when you have accepted Christ or were saved or decided to be a Christian, that that was the end of their journey with Jesus, that you have reached the goal. You can, it's the season, you can spike the football. You can do your end zone dance. But the truth is, as, P, as John, or John, as Jesus is pointing out and Peter is learning, is that it is merely the beginning this decision to walk with Jesus. I have long described that if you were to ever come up with a symbol to go with that water up there, you would take, and you gotta kinda be older for this, you would take a mile marker zero and cram it into that pool beside there. What did the mile marker zero mean? It meant this is the beginning of the journey. The next one you meet is gonna have a one on it, one mile on the journey, two miles on the journey. So. You know, this is zero, mile marker zero, not the end, it is the beginning. The way Mark's gospel end, ends kind of shows us that we're called to a finish that's way away from where we think it is. But Mike, how can I sustain this journey? Well, maybe there's a couple of observations and things we could talk about on the nature of the journey. First of all, the journey with Jesus is not only an adventure, it's a relationship. You're not following merely a set of rules and laws and trudging along with a set of beliefs. You are walking with Jesus, Jesus helping interpret these things for you. Christianity is not so much a set of intellectual propositions that we have to affirm. It's a relationship with someone else. And you don't always know in a relationship what direction it may take. In fact, I would often think of that analogy that even Paul would talk about in the New Testament of marriage. When I marry people as a pastor, I try to do a little counseling with them before. And people say, well, what do you do with them? Or the young couples come in, or sometimes old couples, come in and they're, and they're sitting down with me and, and they've got in their mind maybe what this is about because they think maybe, well, the purpose of sitting down with him is to talk about what you're getting into. You know, uh, the pastor has got magical words to tell the new couple that's about to get married, this is what you're going to get into. Are you sure you want to do this? That's not what it's about. Because the truth of the matter is, how do I know what they're getting into? I mean, those of you who are married, when you got married, did you really know what you were getting into? Of course not. Who can know where life is going to lead us and how people are going to change? Or how the journey and the road becomes different? The main thing is committing ourselves to this journey with another human being. That no matter where the journey leads, even through, how dare we, those vows, sickness or health, better or worse, that we stay with the journey and the person we're journeying with. You know, I tell you, right now, um, the, probably the, the best illustration I can tell you of that is a personal one and uh, it is my mother. You know, my mother has uh, been married twice. Her first marriage, she was 16. Yeah. 
eloped. She and dad drove to Indiana, got married, came home, faced the music. 16 and 17 year olds, though dad had graduated high school, mom hadn't. And, you know, they got married. They had no idea what they were getting into, but they did it together. And they created a family and they journeyed together for 31 years. A year and a half or so after dad had died, she was, you know, in love with Bruce Milburn. And she and Bruce got married. And they have been married now for, I can't even do the math anymore, whatever 89 to now would be. Y'all can figure it out somewhere. Was it 33 or so years? 32. Um, and most of you know for the last five, six years, Bruce has been undergoing or has been changing. He has Alzheimer's. And she did everything she could for the longest time till she couldn't take care of him anymore. And for the last year and a half, he's been in a facility to care for him. But before he left that house and before mom could no longer care for him, she was caring for him. And one day she told me of sitting in the shower and, 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 and helping him get through the showering process. And he looked in, in a lucid moment and, and said, did you have to do this for JC? And she said, yeah. And he said, and now you're having to do it for me. Yeah. It just, the love was unfathomable to him at that moment. Well, the truth of the matter is, that's not where she wants these relationships to be or end. But it's where the journey took them. And she tells me she's lived two different lives. But she knows God has been in the midst of those lives and the journey has been worth it. The truth of the matter is, if we are going to follow in the way, you know, we have to realize it's a relationship that comes and goes in terms of ups and downs. And journey implies movement from here to there. I mean, it's a long process. My theory, uh, William Williman tells us that his theory for why pews are bolted down on the floor is because here on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock you begin worship and if the Holy Spirit moves just right and you left them unbolted there's no telling where you might end up located by 12 o'clock yeah we bolt them down he said to give the illusion that things are fixed that they are stable that they are complete but we are not on a journey of that. We are on the move with Jesus. He may accept us just as we are, but he's not going to leave us just as we are. We're on the move. And if we're on a journey, we wonder sometimes, is the journey working? Because it just seems like the same thing, repetition here, there, and everywhere. You know, when you're on a trip, aren't there sometimes you're about to fall asleep because it's the most boring piece of land and highway you've ever been on? Have you ever been to Richmond? Am I wrong? Is 360 not the most boring place to drive for hours? Sure it is. Do you know that not only have things not changed on 360, I believe the cows are standing where they have been for years. Never moved. In our walk and journey as a church and as a follower of Jesus on the way, there's going to be times when the trip's boring. There's going to be times when there are great big peaks. And there's going to be times when it's storming and there are great big valleys. But we keep walking. By the way, I hope you're writing these down. There's a chest later. The call to discipleship requires that we also keep going at it. Even when we're not enthusiastic anymore. And she knows this isn't. There are times when my wife is not enthusiastic to be married to me. Aren't you shocked? I know I am. 
The truth of the matter is there are those times. So we prepare ourselves for those times. We use that time to discover and remember why we're on this journey in the first place. We use this time it, with Jesus in those moments to, to just keep walking and keep going. We have to have these kinds of disciplines for the journey. You know, a lack of discipline and a lack of preparation causes us to whine sometimes. God is so far away from me, absent from my life. Do you ever consider how often you have been absent from God? Because Jesus keeps going down the journey. He doesn't just say, well, I'm going to wait for y'all. He, he keeps going. Now, at some point, he comes back, if we use those wonderful parables from Luke, to get the lost sheep. But the reality is, you know, the herd better keep following and keep up. Because I've got a kingdom to build and the places to go. Jesus is always on the move. Even by the time we get to the end of Mark's gospel, he shares that the women came to the tomb on Easter morning, but by the time they got there, they are greeted by an empty tomb and a young man in white who tells them, Are you guys looking for Jesus? Well, I'm sorry to tell you, you just missed him. But, and I can almost see the angel doing this, by the time he looks at but by the, this time today, I'm guessing he's in Galilee. Go and get to Galilee and meet up with him again. That's Mark's way of saying that because of the Easter and resurrection, the journey isn't over when we think it's over. In fact, it's never over until God says that it is over. Jesus is always not only on the journey. He seems to always be ahead of us saying, Come this way, go this way. And that's typical of Jesus. About the time we get to the point where we've seen him, almost ready to catch up with him, he's on the way leading us somewhere else. Well, can't we just stay here for a while? Nope, we got some more to go here. You know, the book of Acts notes what seems to be that first name given to Christians as followers of the way, and that is the perfect name for us. To be a disciple is to be someone who is following Jesus along the way. And you must walk with Jesus to know who he is. So today, are you keeping up? Are you discovering that every time you think the road is familiar and you're comfortable with it, Jesus has changed direction and took a turn? <laughs> Takes a road that's off the highway. Come on, guys. But Jesus is not on the map. That's okay. I got this place picked out. This is a great way to go right through here. You and I are called to be on the way. We are children of the way. So let us keep following and journeying with Jesus no matter where you think you are on that trip because you're still on that journey and he's just up ahead and he it is very likely is saying and calling to us, come on, catch up. Because that's the journey we're on. Bow with me in prayer. Lord, you have called us to walk this way of faith with you. You spoke to us. You reached out to us. We followed. Sometimes the journey is difficult, and sometimes our walk with you is great joy. But sometimes your journey can lead to a cross. We wonder if our journey with you might lead to one as well. So walk with us, Lord. Stay with us as evening comes. Be for us bread for the journey, water in the wilderness. Be patient with our weakness to walk as you would have us to walk. Lord, do not walk so far ahead of us that we might lose sight of you. But may we keep walking till we see you again. Walk with us, Lord. Amen. I invite you this morning at this time of decision. We sing about Jesus as Lord of all, and we must sing it and believe it. Would you rise to your feet and respond to God's call today as we sing?
Jesus is Savior and Lord of my life, my hope, my glory, my all. Wonderful Master, in joy and in strife, on him you too may call. Jesus is Lord of all. Jesus is Lord of all. Lord of my thoughts and my service each day, Jesus is Lord of all. Blessed Redeemer, a glorious King, worthy of reverence I pay. Tribute and praises I joyfully bring to him the life. Jesus is Lord of all, Jesus is Lord of all, Lord of my thoughts and my service each day, Jesus is Lord of all. Continue walking with Jesus, even to the cross. And know that this journey is the trek of grace, not just for us, but all who will pick up a cross and follow him. Amen.